Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul and Merry Christmas. With any luck, Santa has bought you all of the gifts that you've been wanting. You are spending time with friends and family, and overall, it is a fantastic day for you. But I would like to say Merry Christmas from myself and Amy here at Red Gaming Tech, and I thank you all for the support, the love, and the kindness, the comments that you've shown us over the past year. It's just amazing, and once again, I'd like to say that without your support, this channel literally would be just nothing. So. Merry Christmas to all of you from the bottom of our hearts. But, believe it or not, despite the fact it's Christmas, there's some actual tech news today. We're going to start things out with Linux and the 4.21 patch. The website forenix.com has actually reported this, so I'm going to link the article in the video description. And you're going to say to yourself, most likely, a Linux patch? Why do I care about Linux patches? Like, what does that have to do with anything? Well, this one's actually pretty important because it has some interesting uh, new updates concerning the Zen 2 microarchitecture. The patch includes Zen 2 QoS, or quality of service uh, updates. Now, these updates are important because they help to optimize the usage of the level 3 cache of the Zen 2 microarchitecture. In fact, AMD recently introduced Zen2 ZNVer2 compiler, and the compiler supports new commands such as write back and do not invalidate the cache, read processor ID or RDP ID, cache line write back, and also have enabled support for NV DIMMs or non volatile DIMMs. And at the moment, the compiler does not support AVX512, but uh, from what we're hearing, it will be supported later on, along with numerous other tweaks and updates. QoS is very similar to Intel's RDT, or Resource Director Technology. And from what we understand about the Zen 2 microarchitecture, the fact is it's going to be of paramount importance, just like any architecture, to make full use of the level 3 cache. So by monitoring its usage, by optimizing it, and allowing, of course, the applications to take full advantage of the uh, size of the cache, it's going to just improve the performance of the CPU. Now, don't forget, from what we understand about the processor, and there are still several details which remain a mystery, because yes, there is a lot of uh, theories going around. Yes, there is a lot of details from AMD themselves themselves, but there is still certain details which, for an old gaming term, would be shrouded in the fog of war. We of course have the 7nm processors which surround a 14nm IO die. The IO, the IO die excuse me, is required to communicate with not too much of uh, an important system, you know, just the memory and PCIe controllers and stuff like that, so it doesn't really perform that much of an important task. Plus, on top of that, the various CPUs themselves communicate through the I.O. die. It's going to be interesting to me how cache latencies uh, differ compared to, let's say, Zen Plus. Don't forget one of the Achilles heels of the original Zen architecture, which was fortunately somewhat improved for Zen Plus, was the intercore communication. Now, AMD themselves have been very uh, adamant that with the changes of Zen 2 and, you know, the tweaks to the Infinity Fabric, that the uh, latency between the cores should improve drastically. But we don't have any benchmarks yet because, let's face it, currently the processors themselves are engineering samples and they're probably still working on, opt on the actual, you know, hardware, let alone the software and optimizations which go alongside that. In my personal opinion, though, and I've said this in numerous videos before, I do believe that this architecture is going to be a very important architecture, not just in the data center, but also for consumers. Regardless of the actual specs in terms of the gigahertz, in terms of the core count, what we can say is it's going to put Intel under tremendous pressure in the short term. Yes, Intel does have an aggressive roadmap. It's hard to deny that. But, well, even if... Intel put out a chip which is slightly faster, let's say worst case scenario for AMD, well, they still most likely may suffer in the pricing game. And that is going to be AMD's strategy. Either take advantage of their core count, 
or simply just pressure Intel by having a platform which offers better value in terms of either the processor cores or performance compared to the competition. And with AMD's IO on the next generation, it's gonna be hard to argue with that. Don't forget Rome, also known as the follow-up to Nepal's, is going to be 64 cores, 128 threads. And when you're talking about data centers with the sheer amount of processing performance that they, I expect at CES next year, we'll get a lot more information from AMD concerning the desktop lineup. I don't think they're gonna once again go for the entire set of specifications for the processor, but they're probably gonna give us a rundown of roughly what we're going to be expecting. But I do imagine we'll get a lot more benchmarks for Rome. Now, and now let's move over to something totally different. The PlayStation 5, assuming it is called the PS5, it could be called something totally different, but let's face it, with the brand name recognition, it's extremely unlikely Sony would want to do that. According to a lot of reports, the PlayStation 5 is going to be based on AMD hardware. Just a quick refresher, it's going to be some form of Zen processor. Some reports tell us it's gonna be Zen Plus, other reports say it's gonna be Zen 2, but whichever, it's gonna be Zen based, and also is going to feature an AMD Navi GPU. There are reports as well, it's gonna be 4K capable and up to 60 FPS, much like the next generation Xbox, you can only push the hardware so much before you run out of performance. But according to Michael Pachter, who is the well-known industry analyst, he gets get some stuff right and well, a lot of stuff wrong. He believes that yes, the PlayStation 5 will be 4K capable. He also claims that the PSVR attachment will be capable of running up to 240 Hertz. I don't I don't think that will be with 4K though, unless of course LODs are uh, turned down significantly. There are a lot of rumors uh, which are also unsubstantiated with the PlayStation 5. One rumor is that we'll see the PS5 supporting cartridge, which is interesting. I mean, it does solve a couple of issues. The primary one is loading times. The other rumor that's going about, and from what Michael Pachter himself believes, Sony will not have a multi-console strategy when it comes to the PlayStation 5. As a quick reminder, the Xbox strategy is going to be segmented over four consoles. There's going to be like the, the high-end console, which is going to be aimed at like 4K gaming, or it's going to be the Xbox One X replacement. You've got the lower end console, which is going to be the equivalent of the Xbox One S. You've got the streaming console. And then finally, you've got a cost-reduced version of the Xbox One. According to Michael Pachter, Sony are not doing that. They're going to just have a single PlayStation 5 system which could be good in theory. It depends, of course, on the pricing. What Microsoft's strategy here is very simple. They want to undercut the competition so that, at least in theory, you can enter the next generation Xbox ecosystem at a greatly reduced price. The counter argument to that, well, there's two of them. The first is that you're, so the problem here is that you're splitting your player demographics in half. So you have some people who of course are going to be able to enjoy a much superior gaming experience, but the big issue is going to be how developers uh, choose to embrace this because in theory, at least, it does mean that they will need to do a lot more work. With all of that said, both have their pros and cons, and until we actually know exactly what both Sony and Microsoft end up doing with the next generation of systems, it's impossible to know which console manufacturer has the right approach. And then there's also the dark horse of the race, Nintendo, with so many different rumors about a uh, more powerful version of the Switch, and honestly, I don't think that the next generation Switch is going to be released tomorrow or anything like that. I do believe that uh, Nintendo will release an updated variant of the Switch because otherwise when you've got multi-platform games such as, you know, the titles of 2020, they won't really be achievable on current Switch hardware. How Nintendo choose to release that and whether it's going to simply be another variant of the uh, NVIDIA hardware or whether it's going to be something entirely different. We just don't know yet. My, my bet is they're going to continue with NVIDIA and go with next generation hardware. But with all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. Normal stuff, like, share, comment, and subscribe if you've enjoyed it, of course. And last thing, Merry Christmas once again. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.